Hey everyone, my name is PK Gupta and here I have Jeremy Enozelli here who I'm really grateful to have on the show because he's an expert in this topic that I know every single one of you probably struggles with, borrowing capacity. Everyone hits their borrowing capacity and they're like, oh my God, I want to buy more property. I know I can borrow, but the bank isn't letting me borrow. How do we access a strategy by which we can improve or potentially, some people say, have unlimited borrowing capacity? I'm not here to spruik anything, but I just want to present the pros and cons of this particular strategy because it's floating around lots of Facebook groups, lots of YouTube channels, lots of podcasts. It might get you on hot waters or it might be the pennies here potentially to get you, you know, your seventh, eighth, ninth, or second, third, fourth property. So who better than Jeremy, who's a partner at KHI Partners, an accountancy firm. He himself has 23 properties, which, you know, so I can just kind of look at him with some awe and reverence and hopefully learn from him in this um, episode as well. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for coming on. PK, too kind with the words. Thank you very much, mate. No, it's um, it, it is an open topic at the moment. Uh, it's very hot in the sense that many people are looking at ways to increase borrowing capacity, looking at ways to further themselves into the property market. As interest rates have become higher and borrowing capacities have become a lot tighter, uh, in the end, the banks are a business and their job is to continue to find ways for people to borrow. And much like the Royal Commission, when things did slow down, the banks released or opened up a little bit of the mechanisms to continue the borrowing for many, many people. And then when things get too hot um, and APRA has to come in, then things start to cool down, such as postcode restrictions and and uh, and you may be potentially a, a slight whisper to valuers to reduce valuations or be more conservative. So it, it is it is like a, um, a a burning torch. If it needs to really rev up to get things going, banks really open up their uh, their eyes to different ways that continue to let continue to let people borrow. And if it needs to slow down, they turn the gas off a little bit. But at the moment, what many people are doing um, is looking at separate legal entities to continue their borrowing capacity. Um, and I'll give you a bit of an example later on as we move forward with this topic of discussion. But essentially, what people are, are doing uh, in aid of their borrowing capacity and under instruction of brokers or or potentially property professionals is they're utilizing trusts as a way to separate their properties from their name. So there is some asset protection, but they're also looking at trusts for tax minimization. And then little, little but known now it is utilizing trusts us to continue borrowing capacity. Now, what are the main couple of factors that people need to consider to do this or use this strategy? Number one, the property in the trust or assets in the trust need to be of positive nature. So that means that they need to be you know, exceeding the expenses of the trust itself, otherwise known as positive gearing or positive cash flow. Uh, must be able to meet its own obligations. So the trust must be able to meet its principal repayments if the loan's P&I or interest-only repayments if the loan's interest-only. Also must be able to meet the expenses such as council rates, water rates, property agent fees and commissions, re repairs and maintenance, strata fees, et cetera. So in essence, the trust must be able to meet its own obligations without any further capital to be injected by the beneficiaries or the directors of the trustee, or the trustees if they're an individual trustee. So the trust has got to stand on its own two feet. It can't utilize any of the cash from a real person to maintain the asset of the trust. Now, a little bit tougher in, in this environment as interest rates are slightly higher and yields are still compressed somewhat, very hard to find a property potentially at 80, 90, or even 100% leverage to be positively geared. Um, but for the, the few properties that are out there, and it could be commercial in nature or residential in nature, um, there are avenues that properties can be purchased in trust and positively geared from day dot. Right. Now, if it is positively geared, PK from day dot, what that enables people to do is go to the bank, and there's only a handful of banks that are doing it, not all. Um, but it will probably still start to be, will probably get to be more banks later on, but at the moment, only a few. And with an accountant's letter or financials, to prove and show that the trust is meeting its own obligations without any further capital required from the outside world or the beneficiaries, trustees or directors of the trustee company, then the bank will say, not a problem. We'll negate that debt. We'll park that debt in the trust. But the condition is you must establish a new entity to buy the second property. So the banks are utilizing the separate legal entity concept to do this. So those are the parameters that people really need to understand and consider if they're trying to adopt the separate legal entity borrowing concept.
Yeah. Um, and it is becoming a lot tougher. 18 months ago when rates were 2%, yields were 4 or 5%. It was very easy to get positive geared investment able to meet its own commitments and obligations. But now definitely is becoming a bit tougher. Sure, sure. So just to back up a bit and like, I'll try to put it in simple link language for myself. So, you know, before, let's say you bought one, two, three, four, five properties in your own name, and you'd hit a borrowing capacity maximum because your income, you know, just not servicing the amount of properties that you could maybe when you and I started investing, you know, the, the borrowing landscape has changed. It goes up and down in cycles, as you started off by saying. But with this strategy, you buy each and every property in a separate trust. And as long as the property pays for itself after all outgoings, then for the next property in the next trust, the bank says, okay, I'll almost assume or almost kind of discount any debt in that preceding or previous trust. And in that way, you can kind of, I don't know, you can go to the moon and back. Um, is is that a fair summation? And if it is, I just want to ask, like, how long has this been a possible avenue for people to improve their borrowing capacity? And I guess more importantly, just before you answer as well, um, like for me, it's like, you know, this seems too good to be true. Could there be an instance in the future where the bank legal policies, the bank, you know, borrowing policies, because only a few banks are doing it, change for whatever reason, capital requirement standards, Basel, whatever, whatever. And all of a sudden, this whole strategy falls over like a house of cards. Yeah. So the comment is, yes, it is. That's a fair commentary of what it is. So it's a great way to depict it. And you're 100% right. Uh, banking legislation can change overnight. Um, things may happen where the property doesn't become positively geared anymore, able to meet its own commitments. There could be a ton of repairs and maintenance. There could be special levies that get included. Um, interest rates could increase. So this could be something where people aim to do it from a long-term perspective and factors outside of their own control may dictate if they can continue to do it moving forward. So you still got to be very careful. You still got to assume that at any point in time, as I mentioned before, that gas in the torch may brighten and the flame gets larger, allowing you to move forward, or it may be turned off. As, as you, we all aware that banks do change legislation very often, depending on their appetite for loans. Uh, so at the moment, their appetite for loans, they still have loan books to grow. They've yeah. still got investors to continue to pay dividends. They've still got margins they need to make. So at the moment, they want to continue the borrowing cycle. But at some stage or another, they may restrict the borrowing cycle and therefore start to take away many different, you know, many different um, indicators or keys that they've opened up to restrict borrowing moving forward in the future. Yeah, I get. I guess like my beef, and I just want to test this with you because obviously you're, you're the expert, not me. But my beef is like, let's say you had four trusts for four different properties. They were all positively geared. They were all self-sustaining. A person, i.e. me, never had to really chip in extra capital. But what's happened is in a single year, interest rates have gone up and or like you said, Repairs and maintenance have been really high or there's been like huge amount of vacancy. It's kind of hard to foresee right now. But, you know, for those of you who have been investing for many, many years, you know that these tight vacancy periods, aren't, they don't last forever. Right. So all of a sudden, let's say, Jeremy, two of those four trusts, two of those four properties become negatively geared, even if it's just for a year or two. Right. And the other two properties require you to refinance to continue an interest only period or whatever the case may be, you know, does it mean that all of a sudden, because those two are negatively geared, that it's kind of like a house of cards, the bank's like, okay, well, I can't assume that you don't have any debt on those two invest uh, investment properties, those two trusts anymore. Therefore, we're going to assume that you have debt on everything. And now we're not going to extend your interest only period or when you have to go principal and interest or actually you need to, it's like recourse, you need to give our debt back. To what extreme can this whole thing fall over? Yeah, so very. it's a great question, and it's probably common across anyone who's borrowing money. It can fall over. Borrowing money can be, in, in theory, a house of cards. And I've seen it many times. I've been in the industry now for about 16, 17 years. And to see what the GFC did with many clients and to see the Banking Royal Commission, and more so we'll talk about the Royal Commission, many clients, and I was a benefactor of it, went through a very easy lending period. Um, and, and PK, you were probably investing in that time as well. Yeah. You know, 95% plus LMI loans. Um, borrowing capacity was very easy to get loans. It was a very simple process. All of a sudden, Royal Commission comes in and people are stuck. 
They couldn't get out of their second and third tier lenders. They couldn't move away from principal and interest loans. Some people had to sell. Some people had enough capital to go through. So like any strategy, and especially utilizing trust and the separate legal entity concept to continue borrowing moving forward, you need to have your buffers in place. You need to assume at any point in time, every year, something like this will happen. A disaster will happen. Uh, you might not be able to refinance. You might not be able to convert back from P and I to interest only again. So to mitigate that pro- to mitigate that that issue to mitigate that process is definitely have your buffers in place because as you just said it can be a house of cards. Uh, investing, investing in business, it all can be a house in cards. But the what what gets people through is their buffers to make sure that it doesn't become a house of cards. And it might be one or two years that you need to go through a little bit of pain, but then you can come out the other side with still a property portfolio intact. Um, So they're probably the big key things that I'd be suggesting to anybody if you're looking to implement a strategy like that, or if you're looking to borrow large sums of money. Um, You know, if they do change the borrowing capacity calculation more than what they're doing already, even for someone like me there's implications and what I can potentially borrow moving forward in the future. Very similar to the rise of lease stock loans um, with commercial properties, a loan very dependent on the tenant, the lease itself, the covenants involved, and also the interest ratio calculation as well. Um, As interest rates have gone up, a lot of these lease stock loans are now breaking potentially their covenant, uh, which means that if people don't have the buffers in place to bring up the interest ratio calculation, then they might be forced to maybe move that property on, or the bank might take control because they can't fulfill the original obligations of the loan contract. But if you've got buffers in place and you've got, um, I suppose, techniques to hedge that risk, then you should be fine moving forward. But it goes to show, as you said, uh, it can be a house of cards with most anything that we do, especially when we're using other people's money. Yeah. And and that's, I I don't know your personal kind of risk appetite, but like if I was to try to this is just me. And if I was to try to build a business case to my wife as to why we should, you know, buy a separate property in a separate trust, and she's a chartered accountant, these are the questions she's going to ask. And she's going to be like, okay, well, the best way to go about the strategy, yes, it does improve your borrowing capacity, but we need to always assume that we need to pay principal and interest on every single loan in case it all crumbles. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, the bank is borrowing me, is allowing me to borrow money, but I personally can't afford it because how many properties can you afford to keep if you're paying principal and interest? Most Mm -hmm. property investors accrue a portfolio based on interest only and then have a strategy by which to pay off that debt at a later point in time. So I think that's a a critical kind of thing, the whole P&I concept, and that maybe makes this strategy not worthwhile for a lot of people. And I think, you know, when you look at the different entities you can uh, invest in or, or structures you can invest in, your own name in a trust or with a corporate trustee or a company, when it comes to these trust type aspects, you know, you're already paying you know, higher land tax in most cases than you would be if you're buying under your own name. You don't get those negative gearing benefits to offset your own personal income in a trust. You know, it's high setup costs, high, relatively high ongoing costs. So you're Let's say you've got five properties and five different trusts and it starts to become a house of cards. Your holding cost is like $10,000 potentially every year, which, you know, which all of a sudden, I mean, that's huge. That takes a portfolio from positive to negative itself. So I I guess like my, my next question, Jeremy, if you don't mind answering is who is this more complex, nuanced, high risk, I don't know, high risk strategy suited to like or what types of properties is it suited to yeah it's a good question so this is not something that you'd be recommending for someone newly entering to the property market and i've got a bit of a rule of thumb with many of my clients at least the first one two three maybe even four properties should be purchased in their own name to keep the cost low to keep things quite simple Uh, very rarely will we establish you know corporate entities for clients to purchase assets in until they've hit that threshold and there are things like land tax to consider you know, in New South Wales, there's no land tax threshold for a trust, but a land tax threshold for an individual up to about 950k. And there's other states which are a little bit more, I suppose, property investment friendly for trusts like Queensland and WA. And then you've got Victoria, which is not friendly to investors at all in terms of land any, tax for trusts any or individuals. <laughs> Um, But nevertheless, there needs to be that little bit of foundation being built up first. There needs to be a progression of growth. There needs to be a progression of income as well. 
you know, if you're in a business where your income's 50, 60 grand for the first year, you're not going to be spending the same type of money as if you're a business that was turning over four or five million with a one or $2 million profit. So you, you need to make sure that you're investing, you're utilizing the structure, utilizing the tools for that period of time that you're currently in. You yeah. know, if you're you know needing, and I like to call it the truck philosophy, if you need a very big truck to tow a boat, you buy that very big truck to tow the boat but you don't buy that very big truck to tow a, di- a dinghy. You know, you can get away with, you know, utilizing a small vehicle to do that. So it's making sure that you've got the right tools that are obviously set up to do the right investment and the right things as well. So at least, you know, at least three to four properties is what I'd like to see people to be owning first before they look at trusts. As I said, keep the Can I just ask a challenging question? Please don't mind. Yeah. Um, this is more for my own benefit than anyone else's. So like I I get that whole concept of, you know, there's no point building a massive truck or or many trust structures to then only tow a couple of properties. Mm. I I totally get that. But if the strategy is viable and it it does improve borrowing capacity, then why come to the realization that my borrowing capacity is capped out after buying two or three properties in my own name, why not start that way? And why not start knowing full well that, hey, Jeremy's saying it's a viable strategy as long as you've got the buffers. I know that I want to buy. I'm I'm young. I'm driven. I'm hungry. I want to retire early. I want to get 10 properties in whatever years. Why not start with that strategy? Yes, yeah, so it's a good good question. It's to stop the house of cards effect. <laughs> That's probably that's probably the best uh, best answer I can give because if you're artificially creating um, you know new rules with inside the system that's there to increase your borrowing capacity, there will be a time where the piper needs to get paid. So everything may go on to P and I at that particular stage. Now, if you're not in a position that you can refinance back to interest only because of multiple other reasons, it could be a couple of years of negative gearing or some expenses that were unforeseen, then all of a sudden you're stuck and you're forced to sell a property. So it's one of those things where I tell my clients, show me, show me you've got the first one or two properties, show me first you've got the one or two or three properties. Let's see if this is really for you. Let's see if you can handle, you know, the emotional side of investing, the physical side of investing, the intelligent side of investing. So it's kind of like putting yourself through the various tests. You do forego some potential benefits from a borrowing capacity point of view with hindsight, you know, right in front of you. But at the same time, it's good to go through the normal journey. Mm. I think when you try to skip a couple of different things, all of a sudden you're missing the fundamentals of property investing and what you need to go through to become a better, more sophisticated investor. So to put it shortly, that utilizing trust to increase borrowing capacity or separate legal entities, it really is for the more sophisticated investor. And you need to have a good core foundation portfolio being established. And you need to have some good buffers in place before you go ahead and do it as well. Sure. So kind of like what I'm hearing is don't be a hero. Like don't just absorb a lot of content and be like, okay, like I'll learn from other people's mistakes and I'll just go and do the perfect strategy, actually, you know, walk before you can run kind of thing. Absolutely. And and coming back to it, the right property needs to be bought as well. So, you know, you need to be looking at that property with maybe a bit of X factor. And it could be a property where there can be substantial cash flow from it. It could be a house with the potential for a granny flat that you can afford to do today, not 10 years from now, but today. Or it could be already a house with a granny flat. It could be a dual occupancy property. It could be a property where the numbers make sense to knock it down, rebuild, maybe one into three, and there'll be substantial cash flow from it. It could be a commercial property where you can add additional value by mezzanine by putting a mezzanine on there. So there needs to be the ability to really ramp up the cash flow independent from just waiting for rent rises to come through. So a lot of my portfolio where my buffers are in place and what I've been doing over the last two years, because I've put my hand up and said, investing in the last two years is pretty tough. You know, you you were buying properties potentially where you weren't sure what the value was, um, you know, compared to where it was, say, pre-COVID pandemic. And if you bought right at the peak in January or February of 2022, you may have lost anywhere between 5, 10 and 15% of capital value. Yeah. So for me, I was really saying, well, I'm going to go and pivot and have lots of cash flow now in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. So I spent time building granny flats, building duplexes. I added uh, value where I possibly could from a capital point of view. I added rental value by adding rooms, renovating where I possibly could. So that was my buffer to hedge against any borrowing implications or any capital downfalls. Yeah. 
Now, again, if, if you've got a client who is looking at one day, hey, I love this particular property, it's going to be heavily negatively geared for the next 10 years, but I'm really buying it for that capital point of view. I would really question that client PK and say, well, A, can you afford to hold this property A without the tax benefit that you're receiving from it? That's the first question I ask. And the second question I ask is that if it's really negatively geared by that much and we're purely looking at a capital play, one might argue and say, well, what's the land tax implications in there? Um, it's not going to assist you from a borrowing capacity point of view. And the only thing that I can think about that may work for you in your favor is the capital gain tax ability to di- ability to distribute that. Right. Um, so you've got to start weighing out that pros and cons. And if the cons just far outweigh the pros, then sometimes you've got to revert back to a very simple way of investing um, or vice versa. So there's many things to consider. Each property needs to have a business plan attached to it. Mm-hmm. And you need to be able to execute it, not just say that you can do it, but there's got to be a path to execution as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, that, that's really insightful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. One thing that sort of comes to mind is, you know, a lot of people think that you have to buy blue chip assets. Of course, we should always buy assets which are in owner occupier appealing areas, not just for 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 um, investors. That's just kind of 101. But a lot of people think that you should buy blue chip expensive assets that yield maybe three or four percent because those grow more without sort of realizing, correct me if I'm wrong here, that ultimately passive income is determined by your total portfolio value. And your total portfolio value is ultimately in the long run determined by how much good debt you can take on. And good debt is determined by the cash flow or the yield that those properties are spitting out. So buying two or 3% yielding assets in Sydney and Melbourne may truncate your ability to build a large portfolio base and therefore compromise or sacrifice that, that future passive income, even though you think I've bought in this amazing blue chip area 10 kilometers yeah. or 20 kilometers from from Melbourne CBD, Sydney CBD. Is that, I know you've got a lot of assets on the East Coast and good areas, but what's your kind of thoughts on, on what I've just said? Yeah, my, mine is all about pigeon pairing. Um, and it's a technique that uh, that a lot of people do now. And it really comes back to your personal circumstances. Now, do I need the positive cash flow and the passive income that my properties yield me? It's great, no doubt about it, but it's not requiring me to live. So that's excess cash that I've got that could potentially be utilized for other investments. So what I'll try to look at is I might buy that blue chip three or 4% property for that higher potential return of capital growth if it comes, but I'm substituting that and subsidizing that loss with the free flowing cash flow that I'm generating from say a couple lower end properties, not to say that they're worse or, or poor performing, but they've been purchased for a purpose, you know, good areas, but good yields that I've been able to extract by putting, uh, you know, potentially a granny flat or a duplex on. And that is helping to subsidize the portfolio for the growth on the other side with another property. If you can execute something like that, you're getting the benefit of both worlds. You're getting a portfolio that's now not costing you any money, but you're also getting a portfolio that potentially has a very high upswing when it comes. It doesn't work all the time. It definitely doesn't work all the time, but if you can, if you can see what your strategy is or what you need to achieve that, then that's ultimately the goal. And it may work for higher income earners, and it may not work for lower income earners, mm. because at any point in time, the costs on that higher end blue chip property may attract high level of land tax, yeah. high level of repairs and maintenance, and that needs to needs to be factored in as well. So you're not going to get it perfect. Um, but as your portfolio does grow and you've got the economies of scale, it does become a lot easier. It's just, it's getting to that first sometimes one, two, three, four, five. And with my portfolio, I found PK, getting to the first five was the hardest. Going from five to 10 was actually pretty easy. Going from 10 to 15 again, a struggle, even worse than getting the first five. Right. Uh, and then getting from 15 to 20, it became very easy because that compounding return, equity wasn't really an issue anymore. And then all of a sudden you had rates coming down, rent still going up a little bit, and then things just really exploded very quickly because you've got multiple assets, multiple cogs in that machine. Right. But then the reverse can happen. You've got a downsizing market. You've got capital diminishing substantially, mm-hmm. and you've got costs now substantially increasing with interest. So as good as a portfolio is quite large in an upswing market, it can be substantially detrimental in a downswing market. And yeah. it comes back to the comment that I made earlier, buffers. 
if you can afford to get through the tougher periods, it makes the better period so much more fun and easier. Yeah, this this is so fun for me to hear because, yeah, this is just like truth bomb. Like this is just like brass tacks of property investing. I don't think anyone talks about buffers. And I'm going to maybe the last question I'm going to ask you about trying to quantify buffers in, in a second. But before we get there, um, everyone, as they're probably watching or listening, this is probably thinking like, you just made the statement, Jeremy, about how getting from your first to five properties was the easy one. And probably a lot of, at least my audience is thinking, but PK, like I'm only at my second property and I'm already stuck or I can't even get to my third or I can't get my third from to my fourth. Um, so they're probably wanting me to ask you this question, but I'll just preface it by saying that for me, I, in a PAYG job, I got to a portfolio value of over 5 million, just fine. And I was buying affordable property, not the blue chip stuff. It's just affordable, high yield. And, and thankfully, um, they were growing, right? So pigeon pairing wasn't for me, but I took a different approach, which, which was working for me. But to, for, for me to get from that sort of five plus mil portfolio to a 10 plus mil portfolio, I honestly needed to increase my income. Mm -hmm. I started a couple of businesses, started doing development. So like when people th hear a story like mine or 12 properties, they're like, how on earth can PK, someone like PK get it? I'm stuck at two. The bank's not going to lend me any more money. And when they hear of yours, 23 properties, and they hear that sort of life cycle where it was easy, then difficult and easy, they're like, it's hard for them to comprehend, right? Because they're this stuck after just one they're stuck after just two or three especially with rising rates so like um was it that your uh, and yeah you know, feel free to be honest like was it that your business income or other income was rising or was it the portfolio multiple assets as rent rises that becomes kind of like this you know whirlpool of just cash that you're swimming in and that's what banks are loving like take <laughs> us through how you actually not you don't have to go one by one yeah, but how yeah, did you actually so get to there <laughs> we've got to remember that's over 15 16 years of there you go business. yeah so that's the key <laughs> thing there's different cycles in that time so you know, in, in the early stages, prices are relatively cheap. Um, and we're talking, you know, early 2006 and sevens and eights, prices were fairly cheap and rents weren't the best, mind you, but borrowing was a little bit easier. And then post GFC, rent uh, interest rates did go up, prices came down a little bit more. Uh, but then again, the banks started to really ease up in terms of lending because they needed to get the economy started. So things were a little bit easier from a lending perspective. Then value started to grow. All of a sudden, equities there, rental incomes are moving, the economy is moving. We've got a um, a mining boom going on. So you know, I'm this was about ten years ago. Is this that is you're ten saying? years ago. Yeah. So we're talking now, two thousand seven through to two thousand eleven. Yeah. You know, things are really starting to move. So it's really taking advantage of the economic environment that you're in. You know, so from eleven to say fifteen, sixteen, we're in a boom time. Mm -hmm. a boom time in pretty much majority of the country apart from WA during that particular time. And then Banking Royal Commission comes along. Now, all I've done is I've made sure that I had plenty of equity, plenty of cash on the sidelines that I've extracted out. And I was able to come back in and have my next frenzy of purchasing, which was during the Royal Commission. So I look at the way I've purchased properties and it's come in blocks. And it comes in blocks during the period of time where there's a bit of a dip in the property market. And it comes back to the old Warren Buffett methodology, right? Get in while others are getting out or be greedy while others are fearful and fearful others are greedy. I'm looking for that time when there's fear in the market. Royal Commission was fear in the market. GFC was fear in the market. And now we're in a high interest rate environment. There's fear in the market. And there's a, a number of reasons why I did sell down, you know, close to nine, 10 properties in the last 12 to 18 months, because the numbers were just insane not to. You know, when you're buying a property for, say, the mid threes and mid fours with rentals of mid three hundreds to four hundreds, and that property going to eight, eight hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars in the space of two years, and the rents are still relatively the same. You know, I asked myself as an investor, would I buy something for seven, eight hundred thousand, renting for three, four, four hundred and fifty dollars a week? The answer is no. That's a good time to say, well, I need to put my money into a better asset that's returning a better bang for my or better buck for my, or better bang for my buck. Um, so hence the reason why over such a long term of investing, I've had blocks where I bought, things were easy, things were tough. When they were tough, I battened down the hatches and I went into a bit of a saving and accumulation mode. When things are easy, I really loosened up and, and tried to acquire more properties by getting into more debt but always trying to maintain buffers throughout the process. Now is actually a relatively easy time if you've got the borrowing capacity, the buffers in place, and you're looking to get into the market. 
compared to say 18 months ago pk where 40 people were lining up to, <laughs> to go through an open home so yeah. it, it's, we ask it, our, our friends over in wa they're like those times are still he's still here it's hard to buy in a lot of places in perth right now um no that that does make sense thank you for for sharing because it's that whole accumulation pause maybe sell down then accumulation pause batten the hatches i don't think we hear enough stories about that and it, that's really interesting to hear and i guess my last question will be back to the buffers so um you know of course we can't provide financial advice and what other people should be doing but like how do you treat it yourself do you have like a um, X thousand dollars that you stow away per property, or do you have a ratio, or or how do you approach this concept of having buffers? So I like to have anywhere between three to four months of the property's expenses as a buffer. So if the interest, repairs, and maintenance, council rates, property agent fees, and all those costs may add up to four thousand dollars a month or three thousand dollars a month, I'll park anywhere between nine to twelve thousand dollars into an offset account, of course, because we need to make our money working for us in that interim. But I'll park that money into a buffer account. And that's something that I'll only ever dip into if there is such an absolute cracker deal out there. Yeah. Um, but if there's not, that money's there. That money's my security blanket. And very rarely in you know in my time and very rarely when I've seen it across many of the clients that I manage, will a property stay vacant for more than three or four months? And that's you know, most people have landlord insurance and other insurances as well. So hopefully that kicks in. And if there is an extended um, time of, you know, vacant, uh, not vacant time, or extended period of time that a tenant's not there, very rarely do you see a property not tenanted for three or four months. Yeah. So I think that's a very healthy buffer to have. That should see you through, you know, the tougher periods of times. And again, if you need to dip into it, you do. Uh, but you, know, you really shouldn't in unless there's something absolutely too good to say no to. Yeah, and there's plenty of those deals about to come online as well. And coming back to that original concept of buying in different trusts, different properties, the buffer that I would think I would do for myself if I was to em employ that strategy would be to always be able to pay principal and interest for at least a year or two if that house of cards fell down. Of course, everyone's different, but that's just how I would approach it. And and last question for me then, um, Jeremy, I really, really appreciate your time, um, is you know, it's kind of a unique situation. You know, you said that you started buying a lot of properties when the market wasn't that great in the GFC and then around the Royal Commission. Two common ingredients of those periods where the interest rates were coming down. Now we're in a similar, you know, environment where sentiment is weak, property prices are dropping, just like those two periods. But the difference, of course, is interest rates are rising. What's your like sort of advice to people right now? Because everyone's thinking this question, right? Like, is this the right time to buy or not? What well, I mean, obviously not saying yes or no, but how do we pick people um, think about that from a property investor who has 23 properties? Yeah, so it's a really good question to ask, and you've got to really understand the numbers of how the property works. So it's all relative. Um, you know, definitely as interest rates are starting to go up again, it will reduce prices because it reduces the borrowing capacity. Reducing the borrowing capacity will reduce the demand and therefore prices come from it. Most people have only been investing in an interest rate environment that's been coming down. So it's a bit of a reset PK that's happening. Um, and that reset is making, you know, your rents now closer to your purchase prices or getting closer to that fundamental purchasing philosophy, which is about a 5% yield. You know, for the last two or three years, we've seen yields dip below anywhere between two and a half to four and a half percent, which, you know, I struggled as an investor who used to buy many properties at five and six percent, which was quite the norm, saying, is this the new normal now? But it was very, it was driven by low rates. So we'll find that there'll be a period of time now as rents will start to increase because rents have been very flat for at least three to four years prior to leading to COVID. Rents are now starting to rise as supply is reducing. Prices will start to come down and we'll start to see that our rents, and this is again your working class area, blue collar areas, we'll start to see that your rents and purchase prices will come back to meet at anywhere between that five five and a half percent. That's my theory um, because it makes sense. If we look at a lot of other investments that are out there, when you've got a five, five and a half percent gross yield in property, by the time you take expenses into account, that's a net yield of anywhere between about 4.2 to 4.5, 4.6%. But when you start to compare then other apples and other apples, and people talk about 
you know, not being able to get loans with, say, shares, for instance, you can. There are margin loans and other ways of doing it. Risky as well, but nevertheless, there are. But when you've got dividends that are producing anywhere between four and a half to five and a half percent net yield, well, then from a cash flow perspective, it makes sense to invest in potentially shares if properties yeah. are yielding at 3%. And again, when you've got interest rates, bank deposit interest rates, and Macquarie, for instance, is one that I can you know, share. It's 4.5% introductory, mind you, for five, six months by memory. But that's a 4.5% net yield on your money in your bank. Risk free. Extremely, extremely low risk. So you know, if there becomes a time where an investor says, well, do I go and buy a property yielding at say five, five and a half percent gross, 4.2 to 4.6 percent net with with risk in potentially a market where interest rates are increasing, or do I have my money in the bank at four and a half percent net yield, no risk? So my theory is, is that we'll see prices come down. We'll see rents continuing to go up. That five percent yield across properties will become common again. And that's what I'm really looking for when I'm buying investment properties at the moment. Sure. So great, great summation. And of course, there's always markets within markets. I completely agree with that sort of threshold of 5%. And when I sort of think about commercial property, it's a similar vein, sort of vein or school of thought, you know, the term deposit, CBA, 4% risk free, or like basically risk free, let's be honest. And a lot of commercial property, good areas, good quality assets are cap rates or yields are like between five and six, maybe six and a half percent. And the lending that for those is about five and a half to six percent as well. So even if you're putting down 30% deposit, you're not really making much. And commercial property is, I, I think, a little bit more tied um, to the interest rate cycle than residential property with different demand drivers. So it just doesn't, yeah, just a kind of a unique situation where, mm. you know, by and large, I say if you have a blindfold on and you want to throw a dart at the Australian map, please don't invest in property, whether it's commercial or residential. If you really know what you're doing, then do it. Otherwise, if you just want to keep that blindfold on, maybe just wait six months, 12 months, right? And then your dart has more of an, uh, a chance of hitting the right suburb. But of course, always markets within markets. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. I really, really appreciate it. Was there anything um, that you wanted to to share lastly or any anything before we, we close it off? Yeah, I think I th I'm probably leaving a lot of my own clients with a little bit of words of wisdom. So I'll leave the words of wisdom today with um, a lot of your group. It, it's a time where knowing your numbers and understanding your personal circumstances is key. Mm -hmm. This is a an environment now and an inflation uh, an inflationary environment is considered a very cancerous environment. Um, but it's only very cancerous environment if you don't get tested regularly. And that's what this environment, you should be doing in this environment, understanding your financial circumstances, testing your limits, understanding the buffers that you need to have in place, pivoting your personal expenses, having a look at and exploring um, other ways of earning other, other sources of income. So if you stay stagnant in an inflationary environment, you actually get gobbled up very quickly. But if you can pivot, and that means not just pivot your personal life, but your investments and the way that you do business or the way that you conduct yourself at work, if you can, can pivot during this period of time, you'll actually be very successful. And the common goal for a lot of people during an inflationary environment is if you can maintain your capital, maintain your net asset base, or even look to grow your asset base during this inflationary period, you'll actually do very well and you'll come out ahead and much more ahead than probably 80% of the population. So that's a little bit of words of wisdom that I can provide. And I heard those words of wisdom uh, from many other people who have gone through inflationary periods in the 80s, and they're very successful today. And I'd like to share that with uh, with your group and as I share that with my clients. Sage advice. Say, so I'm going to put that in my own pocket, actually, because uh, as you know, I'm not 60 years old or 70 years old. I haven't been through like millions of cycles. So I'll put that in my own pocket. And um yeah, really, really heed your your advice. So thank you so much, Jeremy. And guys, if you did get value, um, please let me know. And if you want maybe Jeremy on again to deep dive more into different entity structures, companies, trusts, or borrowing capacity, um, you know, discussions, leave a yes below. I know so many of you are struggling with borrowing capacity. Leave a yes below if that's you. And we can do more of these types of conversations. But Jeremy here from KHI Partners, him and also his business partner, they've, you know, they've done tremendously well well in real estate, lots and lots of properties. But what I love is whether it's on, you know, these YouTube or podcast platforms, or also Facebook groups, Jeremy's really open 
honest and thoughtful with his feedback. And there is a lot of that sort of advice and um, suggestions and just kind of passing it on to everyone else that he does in different forums. So big gratitude to you, um, Jeremy, for that. Appreciate it, PK, mate. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.